after the late 80s and up to the 90s, uh, the early 90s, we did a lot of these, what I would call sol- Southern Steamy Neo Noirs. You'd mm-hmm. have like Angel Heart, um, and this is all kind of inspired by Body Heat, and we keep Body so, Heat, yeah. yeah. So we have like Angel Heart, um, a lot of things that take place in Florida, and after this movie, we would have like Wild Things. Um, I don't consider that a neo noir, but it's part of this element of like Southern Steamy. Um, crime thrillers, and I will kind of where we kind of fit this category of China Moon, kind of an under the radar movie of 1992. Yeah, when you mentioned to me, I, it's very rare where like you mention a film to me, and I have no memory of it. Yeah, like it's just never been something I have heard of even the title. I okay. didn't know that Ed Harris's few wisps up top could entice the Madeline Stowe. Like a lot of things that I just didn't know this movie existed. There's a lot of things in this, yeah. Yeah, and so when you told me, I said, that's not a real movie. I better look it up. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. today I did look it up. I did watch it. We watched it together. Yeah. We're talking about it. China Moon. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. Hi, I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for watching. And for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. Heck yeah, we have a Patreon. Check that out for some great content, some great deals. And if you join the Patreon, you get an opportunity to tell us what movies we can review on the show with a mm-hmm. shout out, of course. Um, go ahead, hit a like and subscribe. Tell your friends about the show. It's a little thing you can do, but it's a big help for us. Yep. Um, also, Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out that webpage for critics' reviews as well as ours. Also, update I will be at the Eau Claire Comic Con September 9th. So if you're around the Wisconsin, Minnesota area watching, uh, you get to check me out in person. I'll be at the Eau Claire Comic Con September 9th. Um, there's deals on Facebook if you look it up as well. And of course, I'm going to talk about my pick of what I, one of my favorite noir, neo noirs, China Moon. That's like there's a guy named Kyle in it. Yeah. Detective Kyle Bodine has yeah, an eye for yeah, detail, like <laughs> which could help him when he falls in love for the married Rachel Monroe. When she commits a violent crime, Bodine's skills prove useful as long as he listens to the voice in his head instead of the one in his pants. But he has to keep covering up the evidence when his new partner quickly catches on to the trail. So this star is Ed Harris. Um, he's just getting a lot of collateral, a lot of clout for being a headlining actor. He's not really at the point yet. He would actually probably hit it with Apollo. Uh, yeah, which is yeah. maybe one of the helpful things for this film being filmed in 91 and then shelved until 1994. Orion's bankruptcy may have actually benefited the film because then they were like, hey, he's actually got kind of a, a movement here, yeah. you know? He can actually headline a film. Yeah. Uh, it starts Madeline Stowe. She was in Unlawful Entry with Ray Romano. It's kind of an under radar kind of a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he did the, she did The Two Jakes, which is a sequel to, Ch- not really a direct sequel, but it is a sequel to Character Chinatown. Sequel, yeah. uh, Chinatown, which is actually a phenomenal film with Harvey Keitel and Jack Nicholson. She was in that. And here she gets the opportunity to be the lead in the movie. This is the first time she'll ever be a lead. Um, you kind of recognize her from she was in 12 Monkeys with Brad Pitt. Yeah, another um, film that came out during and, that three-year block. So, again, might have been helped even by that as well. <laughs> it's interesting to find out she went to school at the uh, U- USC. And I, I don't know if it's true. I found a report that she actually was a cheerleader. So if you know about that, true, there was a report. I don't, I can't verify that, but somebody said, yeah, she was actually was one of the cheerleaders on, at USC when she went to school. Um, if you know true or not, please let me know and put in the comments down below. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also stars Benicio del Toro. This is one of the first full feature film present of him. Yeah, actually, yeah. the night before I watched China Moon, I saw Big Top Pee Wee because I was doing a Paul Rubens oh, watch, right. and I forgot he was, he was the, the dog boy. He was the dog boy. <laughs> um, this is Benicio Del Toro actually speaking elegant language. Yeah. yeah. Benicio Del Toro, who would later go on to be a Star Wars guy and an Avengers guy. and Sicaros. every yes. Yeah, and like have like all these things that are kind of just linking to him. I mean, yeah. great actor. Finally got some work. Again, Usual Suspects was probably his explosion time, and that yeah. was kind of right off the cusp of this. So again, this was in like a real interesting window. time period for all of these people. Like I said, um, it's like a window from that Body Heat and Angel Heart. It's kind of like in between, and then the big explosion of Wild Things that was a big hit for all of us when we were in college. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and as you mentioned, Madeline Stowe, I actually was watching Siskel Ebert uh, like reviewing China Moon, and they mentioned a movie I think called Blink with her. 
um, that was uh, another kind of like these kind of like mystery thriller films that she did where again yeah. like that came out right beforehand and they said hey she's two for two on these and again wouldn't have happened if this film got released in 91 I really think it was to the benefit of this film even the film Delay their release. has kind of uh, yeah. suffered in that as well so yeah um, and then of course the last is Char- stars Charles Dance and everybody mm-hmm. knows that he is the patriarch of the Lannisters in Game of Thrones. Yeah, who would have thought Charles Dance would have that like late career explosion? And yeah. that I think he's always deserved. Um, I've always been a giant fan of Charles Dance, um, and I really think yeah. he was in underrated uh, Alien Three performance as um, well. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. he was in uh, For Your Eyes Only. Um, he just that was his, yeah, yeah. He mm-hmm. just uh, he did a lot of th- uh, sh- uh, theater. For many years before he went into jumped into film, and he jumped into film by until like I think his his fifties. Yeah. Um, he also directed a movie called uh, Ladies in Lavender. He wrote and directed it. It stars I think um, Judy Dench is in that movie too. So he's uh, kind of as moved on, but this is kind of his under radar. It's interesting to watch this movie, and he's got a southern accent. Yeah, it's very <laughs> From- out of left field knowing right. everything else I know about Charles Dance but I, I remember him in uh, what was it one of the recent Godzilla films King of the Monsters uh, the Oscar nominated The Imitation Game he was appeared in as well so he's been he's been slowly percolating um, it's really great yeah. that he got an opportunity slowly yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm happy he got an opportunity with Game of Thrones to really like shine because yeah. he's been shining for years, just never in those lead kind of roles. He also does this on the Big Fat Quiz in England. They do a sample of somebody comes out with a like a, a autobiography, a celebrity that's really inappropriate. And he will read samples of it, mm. like Kim Kardashian did an audio of an autobiography, and he's sitting by the fire with a cigar pipe, and he's reading these like just wild. Doesn't really fit. The book never fits what he's ecstatic, and he goes, and that is a wonderful tale from Kim Kardashian's book. You know. Undressed, and he mm. does this very. It's very funny how he does this. Anyway, reminds me yeah. of uh, Gilbert Gottfried reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Watch yeah. both of those videos; you'll enjoy yeah. the hell out of them. Uh, okay, so it's directed by John Bailey. John mm-hmm. Bailey. This is the first time directing. He was a cinematographer, and he actually continued after this movie being a cinematographer. Yep. Um, he did a lot of movies for Paul Schrader. One of the movies, of course, we talked about is Cat People. He was a cinematographer mm-hmm. for that. Um, he also did American Gigolo for uh, Paul Schrader. Light of Day, with, um, it's a very un, kind of under the radar Michael J. Vox film. I don't think anybody really remembers that movie. Mm-hmm. It's a musical. Um, and then Forever Mine with Paul Schrader. He also would do cinematography for The Big Chill with Lawrence Kasdan. Yeah, he did a couple of Lawrence Kasdan films. Yeah, like well. Silverado, Accidental Tourist. Um, Which are then, really, when you think of those two directors that you could take a lot of information and learning from to make a film like this, yeah. it is Paul Schrader and it is... Definitely Lawrence Kasdan. Especially if you can do a noir, you need yeah. Like, like, yeah. So, you need those two guys, Paul Schrader and Lawrence Kasdan. So while the films that he shot for may not have been traditionally the ones that you would look to as like where they get this information, yeah. still a lot of learning can be done. Um, um, also no- notable that he worked cinematographer as Pope of Greenwich Vi- Village with Eric Roberts and Mickey Wark. That's the first film that actually presented them a uh, big screen. It was, it was a big hit, and then they, they went on to continue. Their legacy at, before that movie, after mm. that movie, so it's kind of one of their pop outs. Uh, and then he did gr- the cinematography for Groundhog Day and The Line of Fire, as good as it gets in Extreme Measures, another Michael Keaton movie. Mm. So this is kind of his first time directing. He never really would direct after this movie. He did and, a bunch of like uh, like filming live shows. Like I think he did one of Lily Tomlin's directing what was called yeah. the the Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. He did the li- the live version of that. He filmed it for release, but it was kind of. That was directing, but it's not really in the same vein as you would see, like a you know, cinema kind of thing. Yeah. So when you're an accomplished cinematographer and you're going to direct, of course you want to find another accomplished cinematographer to work with, and he found, uh, which is Willie Corrant. Now Willie Corrant has an interesting life. He was most notable for doing a movie that's never been released. Oh, okay. Which the one? Deep. The Deep, okay. With Orson Welles, which was made in the late 60s, and through technicality and finance, the film got shut down. It was based on the book The Dead Calm, and that movie would eventually be made, The Dead Calm, Mm. with uh, Billy Zane, Nicole Kidman, and Sam Neill. It's Nicole Kidman's first American film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I looked up Willie Crant, the first thing that came to mind was Pootie Tang. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) We all do a vast array of films in our careers, oh. and I think it's it's always interesting to note that these people have done the highest of highs and sometimes the lowbrowiest of lowbrow. <laughs> and I'll get to my review that's interesting. You have these two well-accomplished cinematographers, and it's not the, pro- the product does not come out what you thought it would be. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, and then also the note, John Harris became president of the American Academy Motion Pictures of Arts and Science for a couple of years. Mm. So he had a little busy work. He was uh, pre president from 2017 to 2019. Mm. Uh, yeah, so you got all this interesting elements. And right, it was a delay release. I don't know if people thought they were ready for like a neo noir to be bankable in theaters. Mm. And it's just kind of like that, right? Well, and the, the film's title doesn't really necessarily make me think of what the film entails. It fits when you watch the movie, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it fits for a marketing perspective. Because unfortunately, film titles are marketing almost more than they are artful choices. Yeah, you think it's going to be like, what are we going to China? In I, yeah, I expected maybe something in China, like a Chinese cast or something like that. You know, you kind of just assume like it might be a bit more of a, a culturally significant thing. And then right. it's like, no, it's a, it like, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, like a, it's a, like, it's like, like a, a China piece. plate. Yeah. That's what the China moon. Right? Um, right. And then they say the title of the movie and you do that Leo DiCaprio meme. There it is. Well, yeah. For me, it was always like, a, oh, it makes sense now. Uh, that title didn't make any sense for the first 25 minutes. I'm really happy it makes sense now. And it kind of does fit what the, the idea of like people do strange things under the China moon. And it's like, oh, that's a really cool idea. Yeah. I was expecting a little bit more of a, they, they kind of treat the idea of this like perfect you know dinner plate moon as something mystical but right. then they don't really ever hint at it after that never really come um, back again so I was kind of wondering I was like is there going to be kind of like a ooh what's going to happen or are we going to keep showing the moon and like showing the events of the film and every time someone does something crazy we're going to see that the moon is, is this way you know yeah um, and I, I, I like uh, enjoy the movie it is very flawed mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things and I wanna, when I talk about the review there's an interesting point to this movie that I can bring up when we yeah. talk about what they talk about the China moon well, but interesting side note as well while we're on the topic of that scene that rowboat that they're in was built by Benicio del Toro's father and gifted to the production just before they began because they didn't have a rowboat to use. So Benicio del Toro's father, come to the rescue! Of boats. <laughs> come to the rescue! Uh, yeah. So not much about the writing about it, but we have a lot of technicality things and the music. Uh, what who the music's by? Well, music was George Fenton's, who's probably yeah. the most well-known person behind the scenes that I could recognize with Groundhog Day, yeah. um, films like The Bounty Hunter. He, he did a lot of music and that kind of stuff. But I'll say this, that George Fenton has done a lot of the bigger kind of productions, never really had these musical scores that have, like, really stuck. No. I would say Groundhog Day is probably the biggest one where I can kind of, you know, but then I'm even thinking about, like, the song choices, not the soundtrack, so. Right, especially when you do, like, a neo-noir, you need a good sound, like horns and strings, and to set the mood. Yeah, you can yeah. tell it's just a very interesting production, but when we know going into it that it was a film that Orion produced right before they went bankrupt, money had to have been tight, and I'm sure that's where some of the choices were probably made about, like, you know, we want to get someone that's going to fit what we need more, we can afford this. You know, someone who may not be, like, as known for these types of films. And you can see a lot of that in kind of the finished product then as well, um, for better and for worse, because it's kind of got some uniqueness and some not uniqueness. Um... It's a neo-noir rather than a classical noir, and I will use Eddie Muller. He's a very aficionado on film noirs. He's on TCM, and he has a very clear under definition of a, what's a classical neo-noir and what's a neo-noir. Neo-noirs are noirs set in most a reality terms. It's on locations. It's real settings, mm. real dialogue. Try to give the hint that it's almost set in a real time, where classical noir with its dress and costuming and its language kind of seems like a fever dream, very surreal, mm. very outside the element of reality. So <clears throat> that's what the definition of neo-noir and classical noir is, and that's why I kind of label this as a neo-noir. Mm. Because, right, it's kind of set in, in on locations, the dialogue seems like it's natural conversations, and the settings and everything almost feel like it's a real thing, mm -hmm. more than a classical where it's almost a dream sequence. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, of course, up next is our review of China Moon. I'm going to recommend, if you like neo-noirs, if you like stuff from the 90s, I'm going to recommend this movie. I understand there's a lot of flaws to it, a get to point, but I'm going to be highly recommending to watch this movie, especially if you like neo-noirs. Ed Harris is in this movie constantly like that, all that mixture. Um, interesting to know that Kyle's kind of never really known about this movie, and this is his first time watching, so I'm just going to hand the keys off to for his first reaction. What is a, his review of what is China Moon? What did you think about it? So I thought this movie started out very strong. 
Um, I really yeah. like the character of Kyle Bodine. I really like Rachel Monroe. Um, it's hard not to be in love with Madeline Stowe, so I understand why a detective named Kyle would do so. Um, oh, yeah, she has a great, one of those classic Onion Noirs, you see her at the bar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's got this, yeah, it's kind of that, like, more so than, than like even like a Kathleen Turner, where it's like, an I, I believe that she would be like, a damsel in distress, and then I also yeah. believe that she might have ulterior motives, so it makes you question her. Yeah, character. very much a neo noir. She seems out of place at the bar. Yeah, like you don't fit in this environment. Whereas, like when you look at like Body Heat, she is danger at the bar. When you see Body Heat, but the problem that I yeah. had with this film, and the reason why I can't fully recommend it, I thought it was okay, but I can't fully recommend it, just being that I felt that so much of this film clung to the ghost of Body Heat, that. Yeah. You know, when we talk about noir films, and I'm not I'm not insulting noir films to say that they do have a kind of checklist that a lot of them yeah. tend to hit. Similarly enough, checklists for films like slasher films. So many slasher films run that exact same series of events. You gotta do one at a time, you gotta do yeah. Yeah, yeah. They all have the checklist that they hit. What makes those slasher films really stand out is usually like the unique backstory of the killer or like the mood that you bring to the film can be unique and different. And the characters around them are all kind of fitting these tropes, but they're doing it in a unique way. When China Moon is doing that, when it's kind of standing out of the shadow of Body Heat, it's winning. It's just there's so much of the film throughout the beginning portion to the second act that it feels like we're getting comfortable in Body Heat. Ah, it's there's the word I was going to use, because mm -hmm. even though I recommend it, it is too safe of neo-noir. Yep. Even though you have a full... <laughs> and it's an awkward, full nudity scene of Madeline Stowe. It doesn't really fit the point of it, but it's almost like you have to have her nude under the China moon. for the, It's a little too on the nose for me. Yeah. yeah. So with, here's the title of the movie, and then you have to have her full, elegant body, and it's kind of trying to put her in the shadow, but she goes into the, the lake fully naked, and it's like, that's a little too on the nose. Right. And Looking on it after the film, I think it's a little too on the nose, because yeah. I think at the time, I'm not sure how to trust that character or whether or not to, because I'm not sure if she's doing the body heat thing or if she's genuinely innocent in a way. And so I think looking at it after the fact, it's a little too aggressive, <laughs> you know? Right, because she's playing this innocent. Yeah. This malice, Ra Rachel's character wins where she plays this doughy, I don't know, yeah. just a gun. That's convincing to me. But when she does this villainous where, like, you know, Barbara Stanwyck did in Double Indemnity, which is kind of lifted from Body Heat with Kathleen Turner, which mm -hmm. there are complete dangers and they're dynamite the entire time in that film. They want to challenge and say, no, she's a little innocent. That's how you get sucked her. She's a little bit innocent like Mary Astor from Malty's Falcon. Yeah. And I think you're winning with there, but then you go to this danger of you're not really convinced that she's a schemer underneath and you understand this is all play. I don't... Yeah. You're playing it too Safe. And I think that's yeah. part of it is the, is the direction and the writing. I think Madeline Stowe is doing exactly what she's being asked to do in the film. I yeah. do think she turns in a, a pretty darn solid performance. I but, liked her quite a bit in the film. But I do think that she is kind of being directed and written to be a character that is not ultimately what she is. And it's kind of supposed to be a misdirect or a red herring. And yeah. the problem is, again, that we as viewers have come to suspect those elements. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I love the concept of Ed Harris. You get to understand that he's very good at his job. Very few in the few minutes. You understand that he has code of control and he is condemned as soon as he sees her. That's a very noir trope. I love yeah, that. Yeah, and that's done successfully. Yeah. Because we know that no matter how these characters make it to the end, we know that they're not going to turn out better for this experience. Yeah. So um, a lot of these noirs, the protagonist, the person we follow, He's not really a hero. He's an anti-hero. He he's very good at his job, but he's underneath there's a lot of flaws to him. And he doesn't do heroic acts, but you know the minute that he sees Madeline Stowe, it's, he's done for. Yeah. And when I like seeing the characters where they, they're heroic in a sense, but they're put in a situation where they have to make the bad call. And I yeah. think that's what I like about his character in this film, is that he is, he is generally speaking, kind of like the the wise mentor to Del Toro's character, and we want to kind of see that relationship bud between these two cops, and unfortunately, he has to make the wrong choice because he's thinking with his pants. <laughs> you know? I would think, and I love John Bailey, and then you have cinematographer um, Willie Courant. Yeah, I would like to see what they had for a conversation because the final product is not what you expect when you have two accomplice cinematographers together. This is shot like it's made for TV movie. Yeah, I had to look up whether or not it was. And that yes. is a complete minus. When you have two accomplice cinematographers, you want to I want to see some impressive cinematographer work. 
I would love to see this movie if it was directed by Brian De Palma. Mm. It'd be an interesting thing for him to do. I think he would challenge it a little bit more. It's a good template, but I, I like what the product is, but I think there's a little bit more of aesthetic that needs to be done with this movie. I think that's what I would crave is a Brian De Palma version of this movie. Yeah. Like a mixture of, body, a of... like body double, um, dress to kill, blowout, and bring it into this movie. Well, there's a lot of familiar ideas of first-time director. Like, if you had asked me if this was a first-time director without knowing the name, I would say yes. Because you can see those elements of it's capably and ably directed, but that doesn't not make a great film. You know, it, it, it's just very, it's very rudimentary. It's very, I'm learning. Right. Um, and there are a lot of very I think Bailey safe. could do a better job if he was given a second film or a third film, given more opportunities, I think he could grow. But you do see that a lot of times with these, they're great at one craft, great at cinematography, springboard and directing, they're running all the facets. And it's whether or not they want to or have learned enough being on a set, paid attention to those other areas. I don't know that Bailey... From the, the film I'm watching, I don't know that he had enough of a grasp of the other elements. I don't know. I don't know if that's a... Yeah, we don't know if that is a conscious choice to make it look like it was made for TV. Mm -hmm. Just because you're rushing and making a movie, you just set the camera down. You don't do a lot of moving the camera. But to understand, Blood Simple was an independent film. Very another cheap. And that camera is constantly moving with the yep. Coen brothers. So I don't know if it's intentionally... Like, Psycho looks like it's made for TV, and that's a psychological element of the shot. Because yeah, you think well, that, was a, yeah, that you, was a choice made because that's all we could afford with money. Oh, well, you can afford it, you know? but you look yeah. like it's safe. Like, oh, it feels like I'm watching a television show and they won't ever show danger. And then you see the shocking element, and that's a conscious decision to make it look like it's made for TV. And I don't know why they did it for this movie. Mm -hmm. If you feel like it's a noir, but my God, move the camera a little bit. I yeah. like the elements of the detective and the elements of Ed Harris knows he screwed from his partner of the investigation of the camera. Very like Brian De Palma. I look at the I look at the photograph again. Now I'm really looking at it. Oh no, I missed this part that kind of seals the deal. What's been going on? You know, the, yeah. the compass on the on the t on the car. Yeah, but that's another sense for me where I feel like directing wise, Bailey's not using his camera to tell the story. You know, he is not his camera is not a storytelling camera. Yeah. It relies heavily on Ed Harris and Madeline Stowe to move the narrative forward. And I think that in, in Norris, it's nice to have a camera that feels like it's an uh, uh, an intentional observer that is actually driving the narrative forward. It is pointing our our line of sight. It's not doing that in this film. Um, it's it's very much stoic in the background. Again, you introduce this idea of the China Moon being something that is, uh, you know, people do strange things in that. Why is that motif not used all the way through the film? Why yeah. is that motif not part of your film? And it makes me feel like probably written under a different title and they just threw that in because, hey, they found a good line from the film. Because that motif should be all the way through the film. And it's mentioned once and completely ignored. I only I forgot about it until re-watching the scene after finishing the movie that, oh, yeah, that's the thing that they're hinting at the whole movie. Yeah. I still enjoy the movie, mm -hmm. even though it's flawed. You have an exaggerated evil of Charles Dance. He is an exaggerated, off the cuff, wild. You're almost like you're overreacting, but yeah. I think that's encouraging because a lot of it is people grounded a little bit in reality, and you have this arch and a nemesis. Yeah, um, I do like that because you get that a lot of noirs. You get a lot of the danger elements, and then you get a lot of oh my god, I am screwed from Ed Harris. Yep. But then you get a lot of things that you're supposed to be paying attention to, like to put the, like to go to the bar and put their guns under the car seat. Mm -hmm. and like, why am I watching this? But it becomes a point at the, at the end. Yeah. The other thing I think is another takeaway from the movie is the ending is not the punch that they think it wants or believes that it is. Yes, exactly. I wanted to talk about the ending. Um, spoiler alert, because we might get into details here. I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, I really love what they do with or I love the idea of what they're going to do with Benicio Del Toro in the film. And I think he is maybe my favorite surprise performance, which is weird because he's Del Toro. Like, he's, he's yeah. obviously great, but he surprises me in this film in the second half because he's actually given so much meat to chew on. His, um, evolu his character's evolution is far better than any other one. Yeah, and I think, like, when you know the twist of where his character is in the narrative and what they're doing with it, it makes, it makes the film make more sense because I was questioning how good he was. Like, he was like... He's really figuring this out a lot faster than he is. Like, yeah. you're playing up Ed Harris' smarts, and then he's, like, stumbling here. And I think part of that is 
that the twist would be great if it didn't stumble. But I do think there's a stumbling in the revealing of how the twist is working and how Ed Harris is falling behind in this. That's a great idea, and that's where the film could have stepped out from behind the shadow of Body Heat and driven its narrative forward and said, we're not Body Heat, this is China Moon, this is our own thing. And I think they stumble with that reveal. It doesn't have the impact that it should, mm -hmm. and that does make the, the ending of the film go, all right, yeah, it's, yeah okay, it's, it's done. <laughs> you know, you do. You have to step out a little bit of the reality of the movie to give us a real punch. Yeah, and what I'm talking about is maybe something like Ed Harrison gets shot, but then he gets a lot of exposition, and they're really capturing. A, you want to sell the love story, then have a little more moments of them together. Yeah, and it doesn't have that. You have this action, bang bang, and you're like, what the heck happened? And we're like, I love you, bye. Yeah. Which and I think part of that goes something back... like a flushing that you get, like in a Brian De Palma movie, like a Scorsese movie. Yeah. That you get a lot of bang, 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 and then you get to decompress, and then you off you go. But that goes back to my argument with De Palma and with, with what Scorsese and De Palma are both able to, able to do is using that camera to tell the story. When you have the action be quick and, and, and jarring like that, and it's just like, that's your movie, that's the end. If your camera is moving the audience through this this stream of consciousness if it's telling us or you know the editing choices could have like put together the ending moments in that in that period and, and given us the twist at that point i think it would have been better but it's just like we get the twist it doesn't feel like it's all that important even though it should be and then we get the finale which doesn't feel all that important even though it should be and i think right. that's the most frustrating part is that when this film could step out of the shadow of body heat and be its own thing it that's where it misses and it's like damn it you like, you were on the cusp, and that's why I so badly want to recommend the film, but I just, I can't give, like, my overall, like, yeah, great to the film, because it just stumbles when it really should be shining. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it goes back even little things, like, I don't think Charles Dance's uh, southern accent is more menacing than his British accent. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. we chose a less foreboding character choice that would have taken away from the film, and again, it's those little tiny things that just kind of dig at the overall narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can see why you like the film because noir things are more your stuff. It's kind of like, you know, I appreciate I those middle of the road kind of horror films. First thirty too. minutes of the movie, you're like, why I haven't seen this movie? Yeah, and then at the end, you're like, yeah. I get well, it. and there's moments of greatness, like right. when, when Bodine is helping her figure out what to do, like disassembling the gun and throwing it on f several different delivery trucks so that they can scatter the evidence. That is such an, an amazing shot and an amazing yeah. piece of story to use. That's where the film is really hitting it, where it's like, you do that the rest of the movie, and you've got me, mister. And they don't. And that's kind of the, the issue, is that when it shines, man, it really shines. It just doesn't do it often enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to sell her innocent play... Don't show her full frontal naked. Or show both of them full frontal naked. Right. We they're both on the same playing field then. Right. And it, Catherine Turner is, there's a lot of nudity and body heat from Catherine Turner, right? Because she's dangerous. But yeah, that's the it's whole integral point. to the character. But if you play this innocent character, Rachel, mm -hmm. who's probably so innocent she won't want to take off her clothes, well, titillate us a little bit. Like, she's Don't in, have it be so easy. Yes. That's like, the thing. Sh, like, expose just maybe just one little expose and don't even have the camera down. That will sell it far more than have her jump in the lake nude, carefree with a complete stranger. You know, and this is an under area, the China moon. This is an area though where using sex as a character and story motivator works. Is that you see Charles Dance and Patricia Healy in the opening of the film, and the sex is like almost violent, and it's new, it's graphically nude, and it's yeah. like that's that's those characters though. It's a good descriptor of the characters that we're going to see in that spot. If you had used Madeline Stone, Ed Harris, and made the sex more of like an emotional sex, an emotional nudity, showed them both about as much nude as you could. Or just have them in the bed the and same, show them yeah. the shadows, right. Make it a more emotional connection, because it does seem to me that you're basically making Madeline Stowe, you're putting her on the same playing field as Patricia Healy, and that character is not the same as the one Healy is playing. So you are, again, comparing two people that the audience shouldn't, they should be contrasted, not compared. I'll show them a bit and just show their legs moving. Yeah. It's far more interesting than Make us stuff. as an audience kind of like root for them more. Whereas yes. this, it's more just like an, all right. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 Okay. Have you seen China Moon? Yeah. My God. Keep the conversation going. Make the comments. What do you think about our opinions of it? Yeah. As of right now, I think it's streaming. I think it's on Plex or Tubi. It's on one of those free streaming services. So definitely go ahead and yeah. check it out. You get some ads with it too. So you have some time to change your clothes and your washer dryer. Uh, and then uh, tell us your thoughts on China Moon down in the uh, comment section below. Do you think the film deserves a remake? And if so, who would write and who would direct? Uh, 
Paul Thomas Anderson. No, he no. It would be <laughs> he too. would get really weird at the end. No, yeah. I'm trying to think of somebody that would challenge himself and make it. So, you know, you need somebody that's really like saturated with aesthetics and color and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. someone who's going to use that motif better. I think. Um, there, this, there's a very much a learning curve. To I this would give a female film director the keys to this because I think you need some like a female's eyes on this movie. Yeah. And I think actually it's it's odd to say that there's been more female directed noir films in the past than in the current yeah. time period, which is crazy because like we should be giving more opportunities because I think that you would actually change up the female the character that's plain innocent. She's not really innocent, but she is innocent. You have so many layers to it. Give it to somebody else because the female character in the noirs is central. Yep. She's the central core. And make everyone nude. It's just more fun that way. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so let us yeah. know your thoughts on China Moon down in the comments section below. We'd love to hear about it. We love our commenters and our viewers so yes. very much. Uh, if you want to con comment more, I, I reply to it back. If you want to yeah, ask me, I always reply back to the comments. Yeah, so, you know, and go on that Patreon. Tell us what we should cover next. You know? Oh, my God. There's a China Sun. <laughs> there's like, there's a Val Kilmer Neo Noir, uh, Kill Me Again that we, we haven't covered yet. There's a lot of other Neo Noirs. I mean, there's Wild Things. I know. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot more Ed Harris. Damn it. I keep forgetting how much good work he's been oh, throwing out, especially Man, recently. Remember the Abyss? Oh, yeah. We're going to talk that soon. Yeah. But we can talk it faster if you go on the Patreon and tell us. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for joining us so very much. You can find all of my film reviews over at GoatFilmReviews.com. You can find my show at the St. Paul Filmcast anywhere you find podcasts.